Back in 1987, Southside Baptist Church was constituted with about 51 charter members. Today, we have some who are still a part of, of Southside who were charter members, just a few. Um, it's, been a, it's been a really great week in, in the life of, of our church. Some 25 years ago, they built this building. Um, they, before I got here, is the reason I'm saying they. And um, ever since then, we've, we've carried debt. When I came in 1994, Missy and I came with two small children, a uh, one-year-old, a little over one-year-old, and a three-year-old. And um, at that time, the church had $275,000 worth of debt on this building that we're in now and $12,000 worth of debt on the piano uh, in, in the back. The piano's a funny story. Somebody donated it to the church and... Um, then they got mad and left the church, and we found out there was a note on the piano, so we had to start paying it. So that didn't work out real well. But anyway, we had that debt. That was a funny thing. Remember that, Marilyn? Marilyn was thinking on the finance team. That we're like, okay, they donated it, but it's not paid for. Okay. So we don't want those kind of donations, just to let you know if you're praying about that. God will tell you no. Well, things have happened since then. We've had... We've had uh, so many great, great years. Those of you who have joined with us recently, really, in, in the last 15 years, you know nothing of all the turmoil that these people you're about to see on this stage went through. There was a time when it wasn't even for sure that the doors of this place were going to be open. And there was a lot of prayer put in by the few people who were left after Southside had some issues. Um, I'm talking very few people in the 20s, as a matter of fact, uh, numbers. And so those people prayed and, and remained faithful and said, hey, let's make this thing work out. And, um, um, and so as a result of that, we began to see some great things happen in our midst. Uh, as far as building-wise go and spending money, the first thing we did was extend the fellowship hall. Uh, there were, if you ever have noticed in the fellowship hall, there's a header that's, that's a little more than halfway through it. But the reason is, that's where the the fellowship hall ended. We had this much, actually we had more seating space because this stage wasn't this big. And we had a seating space for around 325 people, but we had Sunday school space for about 60 people. It just wasn't very good. It wasn't, it wasn't thought well out when, when we built it. And I say we because South, uh, then First Baptist Dieball was a part of building this. And so um, it was built for a tremendous pulpiteer, and when they called me, we had to take a different direction. We had to start building small group space, if you get what I mean by that. And so we did, and we added to the debt then. Then we purchased the uh, three acres north of, of our property where there used to be a house. It was adjacent to us, the, and we paid cash for that. We didn't add to our debt there. Then we embarked on probably the, the, the biggest step of faith monetarily that we've ever done, and that is building that building over there. When we started building that thing, we were still running less than 100. And as we prayed through it and as we, we searched for God's will and, and asked him what we should do, we really felt like we were going to continue to grow. And so we said, let's, let's build it bigger than we need. Because, and, and no offense to, to a lot of churches, but especially in East Texas and Louisiana where I'm from, we have a tendency to build what we need. And if you look, you'll see the first little church little worship center then you'll see a little bit bigger one and then you'll see a little bit bigger one and they start making these in the Sunday school space with no thought for the future well we decided that we would build for the future and so with a hundred people in Sunday school or so a little less than that we built that 14,400 square foot building and we didn't finish out the top floor but that jacked our uh, our debt up to about six hundred and sixty thousand dollars and so we just knew that God was going to provide. We felt like he was going to bless that, even though uh, we would never do that again. And I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Um, then uh, after that, um, we, we built the second parking lot along with that new building. Then, then we finished out the second floor because we began to, well, we continued to grow and we needed a space. So we finished out the second floor up there. Then, then we redid our kitchen and made it a commercial kitchen to provide for more and more people coming on Wednesday nights and eating at other times. Then just recently, we built the lower parking lot. Most of you are very familiar with that. That's a part of our Next Step program. Then we remodeled in here, remodeled the foyer. So in all of that, all of that time, 
we have been in debt. And Friday, I, um, I want to show you something. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I want you to look at this slide, and I don't know if you can read that or not. The numbers may be too small. But what this is, is uh, you see, you can read account details and history. You see, this is an installment loan. This is the, what the church owed as of Friday, $48,761.65. It's what we owed. Um, I told the staff, show them the next slide, not to tell anybody about this. Do you see that? That is a payment coupon for $48,897. And for the difference is interest that's occurred. Yeah, clap. Please clap. <laughs> so, since within a year of Southside's existence, we are for the first time debt free. Debt free. <laughs> And as according to the missions team and the finance team and your approval um, in a business meeting recently, the, the $2,450 that we have budgeted for this building note will now go into missions. So it will be spent, instead of half of it going to interest in the bank, I, go back to that uh, other slide, Stephen. I don't know if you can see this, but if you can read that, interest 2012, $14,733. We paid over $1,000 a month, almost uh, $1,200 a month in interest last year. We were on our way. We'd paid $5,000 this year. Um, we won't pay interest anymore. And so that is basically money that we're getting back, and I'm so excited about that. Chase and Corinne will be leaving uh, in, in a couple of months, and this money now will go. We're paying Chase $1,500 a month. Um, and his health insurance while uh, for the first year while he's in um, Colorado planting, helping plant the, the church. Have y'all made a name for that thing yet? Storyline is the name of it. Is it Community Church or just Storyline Church? Don't know. Something. Anyway, for Storyline, uh, he and Corinne will be headed up there shortly, and that's where this money's coming from. Also, uh, we are paying for the first year Miss Martha Huffman, who is a missionary that we sent out just recently to san antonio and um, we're paying her 500 dollars a month uh, as well and it, it comes from that so the budget didn't increase at all um with those two things happening and i i walked in friday at you know uh, somebody called and said hey um how much do we owe and we wanted to pay this off by the 31st august the 31st was the deadline that we really felt like the lord had given us way back in june beginning of june we owed 156 thousand dollars and this is a Phenomenal amount of money for a church that runs about 300, okay? That's a lot of money. And so uh, we began to pray about it, and the money came in really fast, and th the things started dropping really crazy. We had a, a, a trust that came in from a former member, uh, a charter member as well. The, a little bit of money came in from that, and that kind of spurred us on to this. And so then we had a couple of months of um, some accounting issues, so we really didn't know where we were. Uh, financially, That's why you didn't see the little graphic anymore because we were just trying to make sure we, everything we said was accurate. And we just found out a couple of weeks ago, we got everything worked out with our books and back in everything's balanced to the penny again. And so all of a sudden, um, I start looking at how much money we have in the bank and then somebody comes in with a donation that's enabled us to finish it off. I got so excited. Davlin, who does our books, is not here on Friday, but I couldn't wait. I went and ran, put the money in the bank so it would be enough and printed a check and took it around to Bob and Tina and had them sign it and, and ran to Capital One and said, here, I want you to have this because I don't want it anymore. And so, isn't that exciting? And we are no longer have, a, have any debt. <laughs> and it is, it is my conviction. I only have one vote, but I have a very loud voice. Um, yeah, stop it. Um, it is my conviction. Yeah, that too. That's what I'm saying. It is my conviction that we never again go into debt to do anything. And I know it's difficult. Uh, it is very difficult. People say almost impossible to raise money when you're not doing anything. But from now on, I just, I just, I'm just under the conviction that, that we cannot take God's money and give it to the bank. We cannot. And look, $12,000 was just 2012. It's been much more than that every year. Some, some years, we were spending $30,000 in interest. And, you know, that's about 10% of our budget. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. That now goes to telling people about Jesus, and I'm so excited about that. So here's what I want to do. 
I want to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, um, you believe in what we're doing here? Okay, if, yeah, again, y'all, we need to, let's do a little bit more emotion. Let's have some emotion here. Nothing wrong with this. And I'm not talking about just today. I'm talking forever. Um, I, I really think we, we and, and I'm going to tell you some bad news along with all of this good news, okay? Now, I'm going to ask you this second question. Most of us believe in what we're doing here because we really are reaching people all over the world. We're, we're for the next couple of years, we're finishing up in Burkina Faso, and we're going to begin engaging in, in Maui and looking forward to uh, the, the worldwide ministry that we will have. We'll be going to two places that do that. Mexico City, as you know, is very worldwide. There are 14, 15, anywhere from 12 to 20 different countries worshiping in Capital City's Baptist Church on a given Sunday. We're also uh, going to go to Hawaii where I have a friend that pastors over there. And the church, the reason we're going to help them is any given Sunday, they run about 150 in church, but about 50 of those are members. 100 visitors. He has more visitors every Sunday than he does members. So he, he doesn't have a base of people on which to draw to help with the missions. And there are people from all over the world that come to Lahaina Baptist Church every single Sunday. So the same thing will be true there as we engage in that. So we are literally reaching around the world, and we are also reaching here. September the 22nd is going to be one of the coolest days ever here, other than today. I'm loving today, as you can tell. I, I may get to the sermon, I may not, but I've I got one ready. Um, the, the, thing that, the thing that's happening the 22nd is we're, we're doing something that's going to be pretty cool. I um, want you to bring your electronic device, and we're going to have guys sitting up there. We're going to give you a phone number to text. And this isn't really for you. This is for your lost friends. This is for your skeptical friends. And they are going to be able to text questions to the platform, and I will answer their questions from the platform. September the 22nd, mark that on your calendar. Now, to be honest with you, you say, well, how do you do that? I'm, I'm not scared at all because pretty much I'm answering those questions on Wednesday night already. Um, you will see the, the staff and I have been talking about this, and they asked that question. How do you know? what? The, I said, look, I can tell you what they're going to ask. And I said, it's pretty much going to be the things that we're discussing on Wednesday night. But I want, you to, I want you to invite your lost friends, your skeptic friends. Invite them. It's not going to be dialogue because I don't want there to get an, into an argument, but they're going to be able to text, and then we will, we will. It's not a debate, but, and I will answer the questions biblically. And it will be a great time. We want this place to be packed. And we want lost people to be in here. And at the end, uh, as I've prayed through this and begun working through what I think the questions are going to be, and there may be some surprises, um, and so, but maybe not. I, I've got a way that I'm going to work into the presentation of the gospel at the end of this. So you believe in what we're doing then, right? Le once again, let me see a show of hands this time. If you really believe in what we're doing here. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. And this is the pointed question, because here comes the negative thing. What are you doing that says you believe in what we're doing here? A couple of weeks ago, or a month or so ago, I preached a sermon about really getting involved. And five or six of you have really stepped up. You have emailed me, and there's things. Even one person today said, hey, I remember that. I'm getting back on it. I'm ready to do that. Even tomorrow was what was said. So all of that is good. But when it's, how does your participation reflect the fact that you believe in what we're doing here? And what I'm talking about is, is how much do you pray for what goes on here? Do you understand that that is the most important thing that we can do? That if we don't bathe everything we do here in prayer, and, and I mean, I'm talking asking God to, to give us direction, not just to bless what we do, but to instruct us on what we do. Look, there were those of you when, when we felt like God was going to pay off this debt that said, this isn't going to happen. And you verbalized that to me, and I'm good with that. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's impossible. But you're learning more and more when God tells us to do something, he always provides a way for it to happen. And this is just another learning time for all of us as we're scratching our heads going, okay, $156,000, that's $500 per person that come. Well, during the summer, it's more like $800 per person, including the bed babies over there. That can't be done. It can't be done. But God did it. And so we're learning more and more, and it's because we pray and we seek God, and when he gives us direction and we follow that direction, how exciting is it? How exciting is it to be on this end? When we see something that is impossible and it, and it comes to fruition because we're following him. So pray about it. Secondly, um, does your participation reflect it in the, in the time that you put in here? There's a lot of stuff that goes on here. And it's not just Sunday school and it's not just church. It takes a lot to, to paint these walls and to clean these walls. It takes a lot to keep the flower beds going and, and things organized and moved around. And 
rearranged and getting ready for whatever. We have some staff uh, that's paid to do that, but we can't afford to pay what we need. You, there's a lot that you can do. And I'm asking you, you believe in it, we're excited about it. Hey, I love to tell people I'm a part of Southside because of all that's going on here. But how much do you pray? And how much time do you give? And finally, how much money do you put in? It is incredibly expensive to do what we do. And every, every July and every August, we, we, we're, just, we're just in the red. And I do this every July and every August. If you're, if you're new here and it's your first time visiting with us, we hardly ever talk about money, but when we need to talk about money, we do. Number one, we don't pass the offering plate because we want you to seek God. We want you to ask God what he would have you to do, and you follow his plan for your life. That's what we want to have happen. And so right now, we are like $15,000 overdrawn. Not actually. We have, you know, accounts that are molded, so we're not going to have checks bounced. But we are like 15000 overdrawn, which we're usually 10000 or so. But let me say this to you. Here's my surprise. We all believe in what we're doing here. We have more people coming now than we ever have in the history of this church. And we had two of our lowest months, July and August, in giving that we've had in decades, over a decade. That's a little surprising. You see where I'm at? And I'm asking God. I'm like, God, what's going on? I mean, do we need to communicate this to people? And I really feel like that's what he said. Just communicate it to folks and let them know. More people coming than ever before, doing more for the kingdom of God than we've ever done before, and yet our giving is as low as it's ever been. And it's never been easier to give. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to go online, and everybody can do this. You go to southsidelufkin.org. Stephen's going to pull that up. You go to southsidelufkin.org. Southsidelufkin.org. This is completely unscripted, by the way. This is, for this part, there's my notes. And if you've ever seen my notes for what I normally do, I mean, like, I am very, they know exactly where I'm going. So this is, and you check on, you go to uh, my south side. You see it up there in the top. We want them to go to their, their south side, Stephen. I want them to sign up. And I, here's, because I'm asking them to do something different. What, what I'm going to ask you to do is, is go there and look at how much money you've given so far this year. And take your last paycheck, look at your last paycheck year to date, see if it coincides with the fact that you believe in what we're doing here at Southside. You with me? That's all I'm asking you to do. And many of you will say yes. Don't put in anybody's names. Don't do anything like that. So. You won't be able to do that immediately because you'll have to sign up if you haven't signed up for my Southside. That email will come to Troy, um, and he will get busy uh, okaying because not just everybody can get in there. That's a members-only site, so you, you'll, it'll send an email. He'll send you back an email saying, okay, you're good to go. But do that for me, would you please? Can, can I, will you raise your hand if you're going to go home and do that? Just to check and see, please do that. Not everybody's going to do that. I, I really would. We need it. Hey, if you believe in what we're doing here, and we were almost unanimous in believing what we're doing here, we've got to have money to do it, all right? All right, so... What did all this begin? Well, here's, it began 1988. Buster and, and Mike were uh, good friends, and, and Mike wanted to start a church here in Lufkin. Mike Curry is the founding pastor of this church. And so that's how Southside and First Baptist Dieball um, ended up in partnership. And it's been a, was a wonderful partnership. And as a matter of fact, um, that's how I ended up here was because Buster knew that they needed somebody and that they were very desperate and I was about the only one that uh, well let's just say if they weren't desperate they wouldn't have been looking at me and that's th that's more true than you know but God God was in all of that as well but way back then M Marilyn will you come up here and Carol will you come here I don't think Miss Curry's here I think she's sick Mike's mother is still a member of this church and comes regularly she's ill today um, but I have in my hand one of the original notes the the uh real estate note and lien on this building we're gonna have a little fire today yeah yeah that's good we're gonna have a little fire today and then I had a sheet come on up here yeah missy you want to go get a like a little gallon of water just in case something goes crazy here? hey I'm just being safe we just rebuilt this thing now there are I had a list of people who were here when I came in 1994. And I, and I want you to know, sometime when you get an opportunity, 
take one of these ladies to lunch or somebody else that's about to be up here. <laughs> what, what did you say? Yeah, okay, yeah. And, and listen to the story of their faithfulness. Look, this, this, this has been crazy. All right, if you were here when I came, I want you to come up here as well. That'll be the Runnels, Cliftons, Angie Pate. There weren't very many. And I ran most of them off, so <laughs> the few that were here. There was Ernie Mays and um, um, who else was here? The Taylors. Jeannie and Elmo. Jeannie was my first secretary. Loved them to death. They were just good folks. All right. Um, I want each family to get a sheet of paper. And this literally is. You see, it's still got the legal holes on it. These folks have been through a lot. Okay, I have extra. These folks have seen, have y'all seen a lot come through here? You've seen a lot of crazy stuff? Not talking about what I did. I'm talking about the, the good part. These folks, I, the reason I love the Clifton so much is they were babies when I came, basically. Not really babies, but close. Um, and, and I've seen them grow, baptize them, married them, now baptizing their children. And it's just, it's just so much fun. And one of the joys of being here this long is, is that very thing. So here's where the fire's going to be, ladies. So y'all might want to, um, yeah, and I'm going to light the first one. And, and then you just drop them in here, and we're just going to burn these things. This paper's so old. This is so much fun. I am pretty much. Go ahead. If it goes out, I'll relight it. Let, them, let that one start burning. There we go. This is glory to God, folks. This is an absolute miracle of God that we're able to do this. And I really would like for you to take some time to talk to these people when you get a chance about how crazy God has been good to us and the fact that we are still here. And now, here's what I love. Um, you know, we are, we are one of the churches known in our city. Um, we had a very tragic accident happen um, to, a, to a guy this week whose daddy happens to be the public works director for the city of Lufkin. And um, thank you, folks. Y'all can be seated. Thank you. Give these folks a hand. <laughs> and and um, the assistant city manager gave me a call on Friday. I just happened to be in the office going through. I was on vacation last week, but I was trying to get ahead. You know, a lot of y'all do that. I get in trouble for that. And she said, what are you doing in the office? I'm like, oh, uh, nothing. I'm just getting a glass of water. <laughs> so I repented of that. That's a lie. So. But anyway, I, I, I answered the phone, and it was, it was Keith Wright, and he said, Hey, Jeff, he said, what are you doing? I said, no, what do you need? He said, I um, want you to come pray. And I said, he said, we had, a guy had an accident, and I thought he meant, you know, he just wanted pastors to come by and pray. And I said, great. He, he said, what time? And I said, man, I'm free. I'm on vacation, so you tell me. He said, what? Uh, he said, 2 o'clock. I said, I said, okay, that's just heat. I was expecting that, but I was just making sure. And so, um, anyway, he said, no, I want you to come pray. We're going to gather as many employees that want to pray to come pray. And I had the privilege of, do we have smoke detectors? No, we don't. Good. We're an old church. And so anyway, I was the first call to go to City Hall, and I don't know how many dozens of people showed up, a bunch. Teresa, how many do you think were there? Yeah, it was a bunch. There was a bunch. I don't know how many that council chamber holds, but it was well over half full. Y'all can just leave it there. Don't burn yourself, son. I, can't, I don't have time to go to the hospital right now. I've got to finish. If y'all know the Robinson family, we are prone to accidents like that. <laughs> so anyway, that, that's the kind of, you know, and, he, and as I was walking out the door, Keith, he was serious, but he doesn't know how much that meant to me. He said this. He said, you know what? We consider you our, our pastor up here. That's why we call you when we need something. And I'm like, and, and I'm thinking, okay, I just paid off the building debt, and now this is being said, this church is incredible. We are doing some things for God, and it's not about us. It's about what the Lord has allowed us to do and about your obedience. If you read my post on Facebook, you get that. God could have told us to do this all we wanted, but if you didn't respond in obedience, none of this would have ever happened. None of this would have ever happen. So I'm asking you to go back, check it out. I know we're talking about money, and everybody gets all tense and tight when I start asking you for it, but I'm not asking you to do anything that I don't do. I want you to know my wife and I give sacrificially. 
We do without things because we give. Now, our, our amount, of course, is probably not as great as some of you, but I'm telling you, for our income, we give a lot of money, and I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not, uh, that I'm not doing myself. So, how many of you are participating in Next Step? Okay, you can put your hands down because you no longer have to do that. I know we committed, yes, I know we committed through the end of December, but we don't need it. Now, if you keep giving, we're going to keep giving. We're going to redirect ours to some to missions and some to other projects around here, but, but you don't have to. I'm telling you, I, I've been looking forward to this day like when Moses said, stop giving, <laughs> and you don't, no longer. And even though you said, you made a commitment, you said, I'm giving this, I'm, I'm releasing you from your commitment, we don't need it for next step. If you want to keep giving to the general fund or whatever, please do so. But I'm telling you, you're, resol- you're absolved from all debt. Um, really wasn't a debt, but you're of all responsibility from next step because we don't need it. It's, everything is paid for. We're good to go. And obedience is what it's all about. And if you look in Acts chapter 8, and I'm going to do this really, really quick, but this is, this is great about divine appointments, um, beginning in verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> It's very practical, very easy. I'm going to read the entire scripture um, from 26 to 40. Um, and we're talking about the journey of the New Testament church. And let's, let's listen to, to what happened to one particular individual. Philip is still doing his thing. Verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to desert Gaza. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, And as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch replied to Philip, I ask you, who is this prophet saying this about, himself or another person? So Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning from that scripture. And as they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared at Azotus, and passing through, he was evangelizing all the towns till he came to Caesarea. Now, First of all, I want us to look at verse 26, and then also verse 29 says the same thing. And we want to see the importance of this, that Philip heard from God. Look at it. Look how it's constructed. The, the what was given. The why was not. Philip was simply told that he needs to go. He said, here's where I want you to go. I want you to go south. And think about this. We're two weeks away, I know, because I missed last week. But the last time I was with you, we talked about this revival that came about as a result of Philip's obedience. There was this revival going among the masses where Philip was, and then all of a sudden, God speaks to Philip and says, here, I want you to go. I want you to go to the desert. I want you to go to that road that leads to the desert. And and Philip doesn't say, God, there's so much going on here. We've got great revival going on here. But instead, Philip just goes. Many Samaritans were coming to faith in Christ as a result of what Philip was doing there in Samaria. And so I want to ask you, does God still speak to us like that? Does God still come to us and say, hey, there's a great revival going on. I know that it's going on, but I want you to leave it. And I want to say, of course he does. He speaks more often than we hear. And to be honest, we hear more often than we obey. So Philip heard from God. And then as we keep looking at verse 27, we see that Philip followed God's instructions. And that's what we did in, in our efforts in the last three months. Many of you prayed, and you followed what God prompted you to do. And so, here we are today, celebrating God's goodness. Excited about the fact that we're debt-free. Excited about the fact that we're now able to put more money toward reaching people for Jesus Christ, rather than paying a note to a bank. And, and Philip, 
didn't hear the why, but he heard the what. But only after he obeyed the what did he understand the why. He goes to where God tells him to go. And he's thinking, why would God, I don't know that he's even really thinking this, but why would God move him from an area-wide evangelistic campaign just getting underway in Samaria with great results down to this lonely desert road? Nobody's there. Hundreds, if not thousands of people coming to faith in Christ in Samaria, and Philip's the lead preacher. But all of a sudden, God says, leave that and go to the desert road. Philip didn't need to know everything. He just needed to know that he was obeying God. Listen to me, people. In my decades of experience now, I have seen it dozens of times. People get a call from God and say, this is what God wants me to do. So I'm going to start taking steps to line everything up so that I can do what God wants me to do. That's not how it works. If God tells you, hey, I want you to go do such and such, but only after you get all your business in order, then you wait. But the time to act is when God speaks. This was illogical for the lead preacher of this incredible revival to leave hundreds of people listening to him preach and coming to faith in Christ and to go to this dirt road where there was nobody. Philip didn't care why. All he cared about was what God told him to do. And that's where we have to be in our life. It may not make sense to us, but when God tells us, we do it. Philip did that. And then he began to understand. Philip saw the lost man on the chariot reading Isaiah, and he understood why he was there. This man was a eunuch from Ethiopia. He was a very important person. Um, he handled all the money for the, for the Queen Candace. He was obviously a very religious person. We can say he was a VIP. He was very important. He's a VRP. He's a very religious person because he had traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem in order to worship God. Um, he'd gone through his country of Africa and up through Egypt and along the Mediterranean coast to get to Jerusalem. And he was searching for the one true God. He must have tried many other religions in Africa as, as he was there for so long. Surely he checked out the multiple gods of Egypt. All of this was happening. He'd gone right past all of them to, uh, to Jerusalem. And he found God in the form of Judaism. But here's the key thing. He had done all of that, and he was worshiping God, and he was reading the Scriptures, and he was perplexed because he knew there was more. And many of you are in the same place in your life. You know there's something else. You've been following Jesus. You've been calling yourself a Christian for a long time, and yet you feel like there is something more. What else is there? And I want to say for most of you, not all of you, but most people in that situation, it is that God is calling you to obey him, to do a task, and you have yet to obey him. You may have even already said yes. You may have even got to the point where you say, I agree with you, God, I'm going to do this, but yet you haven't acted on it. You're getting all your stuff in order. I can point you to people. I can tell you where they live. I can give you names of people who have started out getting their things in order to follow God's command. And to this day, they are still trying to get stuff in order to follow God's command. It happens. This man was prepared to hear the gospel. He was looking for something more, as many believers are. This, this, he was a very religious person, and all he knew at that time was Judaism to be the, true, the one true God. It was the religion of the one true God. The Spirit of God had been working in him to create this God-shaped vacuum in his heart, just like he's done for many of you. And if you yes to Jesus and you've said yes to him and you are a follower of Christ and yet you still feel like there's something more, I am saying to you, you're missing out on being obedient. Almost always that's the case. This man is very influential. He's very religious. And here's the thing. Just like the obedience of this body of Christ led to the excitement that we had today in starting a fire, so Philip's obedience to Christ changed the life of this Ethiopian youth. Philip's obedience resulted in an invitation to join the lost man on his chariot. The conversation that ensued centered on the gospel. That's what happens when you begin to follow Christ. What happens when you begin to obey him unequivocally, when you don't try to get things in order or you don't try to do it in a way that, that is okay with everybody, you just do what God tells you to do, you begin to see things happen. You begin to see invitations come to you. Most of the time when I lead people to Christ, I, I was refereeing basketball Thursday and was praying for the guy all the way over there um, and, and, and asked the Lord, 
make sure, God, we have plenty of time to talk. Usually in junior high games, it's very busy. They don't have much time between games. They don't have, and I hadn't seen the guy in a couple of years, so I knew right before wouldn't be the time. And, and I'm, I'm not kidding you. I'm like, God, I need time. I, you know, it can't be three minutes between games or a minute between quarters. I need time. And so we are out on the court. We're refereeing basketball. And all of a sudden, there's a bunch of kids playing upstairs in the weight room. And they accidentally jump too hard and something happens. And all the lights in the gym go off. Mercury vapor lights, if you know anything about them. 20 minutes to, to cool down and then another 15 minutes to warm back up. I had 35 minutes to sit in that room and talk to this kid about Jesus. And I'm like, how easy can that be? I'm like, God, I gotta have time. And I'm thinking about, can I do one verse evangelism in three minutes between a game? And no, you can't. And so it was hilarious when the lights went out and I'm thinking, God, you are just too good. And so we had a great conversation and hopefully he's in church today. He lives 50 miles from here. And he's a college kid, so he didn't have the gas to drive here. But I said, no, man, go somewhere else. But the fact is that when you follow God's instructions, those things happen. Um, uh, this, this guy's reading Isaiah. It's that easy. Just like the light's going out for me, it couldn't have been any more obvious. God's saying, there's your chance. Philip does what he's supposed to do, and he hears this eunuch, um, this Ethiopian guy saying, hey, what's this mean? He's reading Isaiah, and he says, what's this mean? And Philip's like, okay. That's the kind of thing that happens when you obey God. You say, it's difficult for me to share my faith. I'm scared to share my faith. I get that. I understand that. I even empathize with that. But the fact of the matter is, when lights start going off, and a guy says, hey, come get on my chariot and tell me about Jesus, that makes it a little bit easier, doesn't it? And that's the kind of thing that happens when you say, okay, God, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to pray to you, and I'm going to seek to you. And, and that's, that's exactly what happened. So Philip tells the eunuch the good news of Jesus Christ. Verse 35, he says to him, in some way, shape, or form, God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. He says, man is sinful and separated from God. He tells him that Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. And then he says to him, we must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. He tells the guy that. And obviously, he gets excited and says, I'm committing my life to Jesus. Notice that there's not some time where they stop and he leads him in a prayer. Do you notice that? We have so much e e equated salvation with praying a prayer. That's not what happens. This guy says, okay, I'm committing my life to Christ. And Philip goes on to explain to him one of the first things you want to do to, to uh, identify with Christ is to be baptized. Obviously, he's taught him that. And so what does the eunuch do? He's like, oh, man, I'm committed to Christ. First thing I'm supposed to do is be baptized. Hey, there's some water. Why can't we be baptized in that mud puddle? I mean, really, that's what he said. And so he tells his chariot driver, hey, stop it. I got to go be baptized. And the chariot driver's probably going, my boss has flipped his lid. He has lost it. But yet, that's exactly what he did. And so that's, that's what he was teaching this eunuch. And salvation came to the Ethiopian. Look at verses 36 through 40. We, we, begin to, we, we read those earlier, and we see that this, this new believer obviously wanted to identify with Christ. When they came upon that oasis, it probably really wasn't a mud puddle. I'm just exaggerating. It was an oasis. He said, hey, let's be let me be baptized. Let me follow Christ. And that's the kind of thing. This Ethiopian now was following Christ with reckless abandon. Why wait? What would, what would be the, the, the benefit in waiting? Let me be baptized now, and then I can go back to Ethiopia, and then I can do what? I can begin to tell everybody what you've told me. This Ethiopian, obviously, is, he, he was asking a question. When, they, when he came to that oasis, he asked Philip what would prevent him from being baptized. And you have to look at that wording carefully. Because he was saying, I, why can't I be? He, he was saying, I, I, don't, I don't think I can be. Nobody had told him before he made his long journey to Jerusalem that, that even if he accepted Judaism, that he could really never become a Jewish proselyte proselyte because of his physical situation and so he he understood that he couldn't be a full-fledged jew but he wanted to worship god so he says is there anything to keep me from being a baptized christian like being a jew philip said to him and how wonderful it must have been for this eunuch to say there is nothing to keep you from completely following christ and i know that many of you ask the same question you look at your you look at yourself spiritually you look at yourself 
and, and think, I can't be th this Christian. I can't do this. All this junk that's in my life, all the sin that I have, all the bad stuff, all the bad thoughts that I have, I can't be what God wants me to be. The eunuch had the same thought. In Judaism, they said, your body is not perfect. Uh, it, it's, it's blemished, therefore you can't be a full Jew. He said, I can't be a Christian, can I? And Philip said, yes, you can. And so the same answer is given to you, except through the power of the Holy Spirit, using my mouth as, as a mouthpiece. It doesn't matter what you're thinking right now. The thing that would keep you from selling out to Jesus, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know how long I've been doing it. You don't know how recent it was that I did it. It's irrelevant. You too can be completely obedient to God. It just takes you saying, God, I'm ready. Just like the eunuch. It takes you looking over and saying, what's wrong with that body of water? Can't I do this? And the Holy Spirit's going to say to you, yes, you can. And he too, this Ethiopian, became an obedient follower of Christ just as you can. Well, I'm going to blow this illustration because I have to, because I have to to set it up because I messed up. I forgot to go pick up a, a violin. How many of you know what a Stradivarius is? If you're familiar with musical instruments at all, you've heard of it at least. Stradivarius, during his long pattern period from 1690 to 1700, if you have one of those, it could be worth at least hundreds of thousands of dollars up to several million dollars for a violin. The 1697 Molitor Stradivarius, which was once rumored to belong to Napoleon, but it, it didn't. It just belonged to one of his generals, actually. It sold in 2010 for $3.6 million. So depending on the condition, the instruments, uh, when they were made during the golden period or not, they could be worth millions and millions of dollars. One is also sold for 9.8 million pounds, which is about $13.9 million. That's even more recent, and that's kind of the... the um, the record and I had planned in here to bring out a violin and and guy have white gloves on it and and I've seen this done before and it was hilarious it, it freaked me out and I was going to tell you that I actually had an opportunity to 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 borrow a Stradivarius and 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 was going to wear white gloves and talk about how great it was like I just did and then I was going to throw it to Chase and y'all go oh we're in debt again <laughs> well the thing, the thing that I want you to understand about the, they've been researched for years. And some people say that the tone quality is no better than any other, but, but most people who play music, it can't be measured. But the musicians say that when you have a Stradivarius and somebody who knows how to play it, that there is nothing like it. And so they have done all kind of scientific experiments on these things to see why they are so precious and treasured. A lot of people think, that they were treasured pieces of wood that, that um, uh, Stradivera went and picked out. But here's the, here's the truth about it. He was very, very poor. And he couldn't find, or he couldn't afford the fine materials that his contemporaries who were making those instruments could afford. So what he got was discarded lumber from the dirty harbors around where he lived. And he would take these waterlogged pieces of wood to his shop. He would clean them up. And from those pieces of trash lumber, he would create instruments of what are now rare beauty. Now, here's, what it's, here's what's been discovered in, in recent years, that while that wood floated in those dirty harbors, microbes went into the wood and ate out the center of some cells. I'm talking microscopic cells. And that left just the, the fibrous interest, infrastructure of the wood that created these incredible resonating chambers for the music. And so from wood that nobody wanted, Stradivarius produced violins that everybody wants. And that's what can happen in your life. Look, you may think, I'm not very obedient to Christ. I don't, I don't really get all of this stuff that he asked me to do. But I want you to hear me on this. God will speak to you. He will speak to you through his word. He will speak to you when you are praying in your prayer closet. And he will tell you things. And when you obey those things, you will find divine appointments just like this Ethiopian eunuch on a chariot. So whether we're telling cities full of people in obedience to God's word 
or we're on a desert road telling one person the good news of Jesus Christ, we are still being obedient. And we never know who will be the next Stradivarius Christian. Some old, dead, discarded piece of lumber laying in a pile to be burned. And God sends us there to make a beautiful instrument of the music of the gospel around the world. So my, my challenge is this. Stop thinking about how much you can't do. And just do what God tells you to do. No matter how simple that is. If it's the first step of saying yes to Jesus, we rush through the gospel. But understanding that without Christ, you can't make it to heaven. Or if it's the next step of saying, hey, I want to be baptized. Or if it's the next step of following God in a new and fresh way. Just do it. Stop putting it off and trying to get things in order. When God tells you to do it, he will order things for you. You're working too hard. If he told you to order them, then order them. But if he told you to go, then go. Let's pray together.